president of Boreal Conservation for the National Audubon Society, working out of his office in Gardner, Maine. He's had a wide ranging career in science and bird conservation. After receiving an undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Maine at Farmington, he went on to earn a master's and PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University. He worked for the National Audubon Society, first as bird conservation director for New York State, and then the national director. During his first tenure with Audubon, Dr. Wells was located at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where he continues as an associate of the lab. After leaving Audubon, Jeff became a senior scientist for the International Boreal Conservation Campaign and Boreal Songbird Initiative, leading their science efforts for almost 20 years, during which he published and spoke frequently about globally significant conservation values of the boreal forest. He's an active birder and for 12 years was a member of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Sapsuckers Birding Team, which won the World Series, series of Birding in 2001 and 2002. He's birded throughout much of the North American continent from the Northwest Territories of Canada to Veracruz, Mexico and in the Caribbean. And in his spare time, he also leads trips for the L.L. Bean Outdoor Discovery School. Jeff has, is an been a very active writer. He's author, authored or co-authored thousands of scientific papers, reports, book chapters, blogs, columns, etc. His book, Birders Conservation Handbook, which I just happen to have a copy of. Uh, let's see, was uh, published in uh, it's 100 North American Birds at Risk, published in fall of 2007. The first of its kind, a bird book for bird conservation. More recently, he co-authored with his wife, Allison, Maine's Favorite Birds in 2012. And in 2020, he was part of the author team to publish the monumental new book, Birds of Maine. Jeff lives in Gardner, Maine with his wife, teenage son, and two indoor cats an appropriate place for them. Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, John. You, you hearing me okay? Yes, Bill. fine. Yep, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping one of those uh, indoor cats doesn't make an appearance here. They <laughs> have one of them that loves to try to interrupt um, Zoom meetings, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to, to talk with you guys and, and to be here tonight. and. Um, Sorry for sort of doing this with the phone up to my ear, but my, my computer has been making some crunching sounds lately that seem to get in the way of my microphone. And I don't know what's going on with that, but I'm going to try to share my screen now. I'm hoping you have um, given me a way to do that. Looks like you have. So I will start with that. And... And um, I guess while we're going, if anything is not working, let me know somehow. Um, and um, I'll try to stop. But um, I can also shut off my video if, um, if that, maybe I'll just do that. Uh, well, I, I won't do that now. But if, if you're having any trouble with any of this, let me know and I'll shut off my video cut in. So yeah, I'm, you see the title here, The Biggest Bird Conservation Story You've Never Heard. Maybe there are some of you who have heard about it, but I'm guessing there's some aspects of it that you, that you don't know about. Um, but I want to start off with, with a little story that relates to this photo here and, and the photos um, you're about to see. And it's a story about May 28, 2018 which was a day that will go down in birding history. That's because it was the day that the largest number of warblers was ever seen in one location in one day. Even a non-birder would have to have been, been startled by the numbers. Um, the birders there estimated over 700,000 of these brightly colored gems of the bird world passed by them um, on that unforgettable nine hour day. They were 
in Quebec along the north shore of the St. Lawrence at the Tadoussac Dunes, which is a pretty famous birding area. Um, but it had never seen anything quite like this. Um, it's a, a, a well, three-hour drive sort of northeast from Quebec City. Um, and these are actually photos from that event. That day, they saw an estimated 144,000 of these bay-breasted warblers. 29,000 Blackburnian warblers passed by them that day. 108,000 Cape May warblers. Um, and they, they talked about how some of these birds were actually, as they were streaming by, were passing, you know, right by them or even through their legs as they were sort of standing there counting them. And while these birders were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, document this kind of abundance, the fact that it was possible to even have 700,000 warblers in one place at one time is because of a special place they were migrating to, the, the boreal forest in North America. Many of you um, maybe have seen some graphics like this, some maps. Um, this is a recreation of the world's forests prior to the industrialization of, of the world. 80% um, of those original forests have been, have been cut over and lost, fragmented. Um, these areas here you see on this map are the, the remaining areas that have never been um, cut over, never, never been um, heavily impacted by industrial development. And the boreal contains about 25% of the Earth's remaining primary forests, as they're called. The boreal, as we define it here, is the, this area that you see um, in green in this map stretching from Alaska all the way across um, kind of sandwiched between the Arctic and, and the prairie provinces. Um, and then as you go eastward between um, the, the great southern expanse of Hudson and James Bay and the Great Lakes um, to the south and all the way over to Newfoundland and Labrador area of 1.4 billion acres um, and much of it still intact. Because of its intactness, it has still some of the most amazing globally significant um, ecological values still left on Earth. It holds more fresh water than any other place on Earth. It has um, literally millions of lakes, including four of the 10 largest lakes on planet Earth. Um, it has the largest undammed rivers left in North America. Um, you know, some of them like the Mackenzie, kind of a Mississippi um, level of river, you know, that, that, that large, but without, without dams on it or without dams on, on most of it, unlike, again, unlike our rivers. Um, it has some of the world's largest wetlands, the Hudson Bay, James Bay wetlands or lowlands is considered the second largest peatland on earth, the third largest wetland. Um, incredibly dense in carbon. These, this is carbon that's thousands of years old. It's been stored in peat and um, in, in wetlands, you know, post the last ice age retreat, um, a massive store of carbon, over 200 billion tons of carbon. Um, and that's probably an underestimate um, as we're starting to get more better information. There's there's some scientists feel there's maybe even double that amount of carbon there. So incredibly important for, for climate and climate stabilization. Um, a biodiversity cradle, it has some of the last populations of large mammals, um, you know, wolves and bears, grizzly bears, black bears, polar bears, even um, in the southern reaches of the Hudson James Bay area. Um, still caribou that are migrating um, sometimes, um, you know, 500 to 1,000 miles back and forth across, across the boreal, wolverines, so many species, wolves, things that we've lost in the U.S. Um, I mentioned, you know, the migration of, um, of some of these animals. Um, you know, we, when we think about the world's great land mammal migrations, many people immediately start thinking about Africa, you know, the African plains, you know, in the, the great movies about that um, and um, but few people are aware that they there is still one of the last greatest migrations of, of large mammals that takes place across the boreal forest again these different caribou herds that move from um, the 
um, calving grounds in the Arctic down into the boreal in the winter and back again. Um, just incredibly long um, migrations that are still unfettered for the most part by various kinds of human industrial activity. We still have um, Atlantic salmon runs up um, undammed rivers in the eastern part of the boreal and in the western part, other kinds of salmon and other kinds of salmonids that are moving up and down and other types of fish uh, through these systems. And of course, there are the birds. There we go. The boreal forest is um, home to somewhere between one and three billion breeding birds. Um, that's billion with a B. And in the fall of the year, that means there's three to five billion, if you add the young of the year, um, that come spilling out of the boreal forest and um, become the birds of our backyards um, and in lakes and ponds and coasts um, throughout, again, throughout the whole Americas, all the way down into even Southern South America. A lot of times we birders, you know, we talk about boreal birds and we think of just a few particular species, um, the, the Canada jay being, being one of the, uh, the iconic ones, you know, black-backed woodpecker, spruce grouse, boreal chickadees, things like that. Uh, but if you ever look at, um, you know, the, the range of those birds, um, um, you'll see, of course, that, that they are... Um, all found in the boreal, and, and we do have some of them down here in Maine. Um, but the number of birds that are boreal birds goes way beyond those specialty birds that people come here to Maine to see, like the Canada Jay and the boreal chickadee, you know, that just come to the southern extent of their boreal. Hey, Jeff, you're breaking up a little bit, and I think we're having trouble hearing you now. Okay. Um, oh, it sounds better now. Let's keep doing whatever okay, that is. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll, how about like this? Is that okay? That, sound, that sounds great. Okay. I'm just going to hold my phone in front of me here. Sorry if the, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm also going to, I'm going to stop this for a second so I can ch turn off my video just to make sure that's not a problem. Okay, and then I'm going to go back to my share screen and go back to where we left off. Thanks for your patience, everybody. There we go. Sorry. Everybody, you can still hear me okay? And yep, see sounds this? good. Okay. Another bird we think of, you know, as, as a quintessential bird of the winter in the, along the main coast, the redneck grebe. But how many people would have, you know, normally think of that as a boreal bird? And yet almost all of redneck grebes um, nest in the boreal forest. So, you know, boreal birds encompasses a great many birds beyond what we birders sometimes um, classify as boreal birds. You know, everything from sparrows to ducks to waterfowl to warblers to woodpeckers to shorebirds, um, a whole host of birds that rely on the boreal for many of them for most of their um, breeding range. We did a report and study maybe, oh gosh, it's probably going on 20 years now uh, ago, that tried to estimate the number of birds. And I mentioned the numbers. People were astounded at the time, one to three billion nesting birds, um, nearly 100 species that have half or more of their entire world range just found within the boreal forest, and a host of other other interesting facts about that we included in that report. But there's some species, and there's about 33 of them that are basically boreal breeding endemics found almost 100% in the boreal. Of course, we here in Maine know um, a few of these species that, that do also spill down just a little bit into Maine and become um, part of our avifauna. But most of the range of, of many of these species here is found in the boreal forest of 
Canada and Alaska. And because they're found over this expansive area, they reach often um, high abundances. You can see here in this slide here, you know, dark-eyed juncos estimated over 200 million of them that nest in the boreal, white-throated sparrow 116 million and so on. Um, and because of that, when they migrate south and become parts of um, the winter com bird communities of other places, they have really important ecological roles that um, many of which we're just starting to understand and learn about. Um, but, you know, when you start thinking about that many birds coming in and spreading, um, uh, you know, eating um, berries and, and spreading the seeds around or um, eating insects, if it's a, a yellow-bellied sapsucker, for example, or some, a yellow run warbler, whatever it is, just lots of different ecological roles. Some of these species are important uh, pollinators when they go south into the tropics. So a lot of interesting things. You know, the white-throated sparrow here, um, one of our most iconic birds of, of Maine, we think of in the summer, but also one of the most iconic birds and sounds of the boreal forest across Canada. Um, and of course, these birds spend um, most of their year outside of the boreal forest. You know, the, this is a map of the white-throated sparrow, an eBird map showing where they are in winter. You know, a few of them here along uh, southern coastal Maine. We have a couple of them that we've had uh, in Gardner over the over the winter. Um, and I'm just going to start this animation. Hopefully it works and you can just see how though the entire population um, moves north. Um, and most of it, except for little portions of it in Maine and some of the New England states, um, ends up in in the boreal forest. Many of the migrations are even more astounding. The black pole warbler, which is found um, across the boreal forest, and although we have them in high elevations here in Maine, we're on the southern extent of their range, and um, most of their range extends all the way across um, the boreal. That's the, the bulk of their breeding range. And so some recent work has been looking at um, their migration. People had a sense that they did these very long over water migrations, um, and some of the recent work has, has confirmed this with a few um, a few caveats as far as some of the birds um, where where they may stop, but basically these these birds are making this you know mu sometimes multi day um, stop uh, uh, flight across the across the ocean to get to South America where they where they winter. So a lot of amazing connections from the boreal forest to the rest of the world. These are some band return data, mostly from waterfowl. Um, the black dots are um, indigenous protected area proposals, areas that are being proposed for protection and showing some of the places uh, um, that are connected to those places via the banded um, waterfowl that have um, been found, you know, um, far to the south. And you can just see how well connected all these places across the boreal are. Other kinds of analyses have looked at some of the birds from particular regions, like this is in Ontario, looking at um, boreal land birds and where the largest number of the species winter. And you can see, uh, for one, a lot of the U.S. has has a lot of these birds, but the, the brightest orange colors are the highest concentrations of um, species where most species overlap. And you can see kind of southern Mexico through Central America to northern South America and in the Caribbean. One of the kind of these are the hot spots where a lot of these birds winter. And so I've highlighted a lot of the special ecological values, biodiversity values of the boreal. But um, along with being one of the last great conservation opportunities in human history, um, it's also seen as one of the last places for opportunities for um, large-scale industrial expansion and uh, natural resource extractive industries. So. Currently, about 12% of that massive area is actually protected, and there's huge pressures mounting from all sorts of activities, some of which are, are outlined here. So we're really at a crossroads. This is one of the most important times that will decide the fate of this place. You know, it's, um, I like to say sometimes it's the last chance in human evolutionary history to protect some of these last places, to do things differently than we did and the rest of the world. 
and those decisions are being made right now, day by day. Some of the birds that are potentially impacted by some of the um, industrial activities that have already taken place are birds that are found in the southern part of the boreal forest. And um, sometimes when we're down here in the U.S., we tend to think of these birds um, as being, you know, found all the, all the way across that whole boreal region, but many of them are just found along the southern part, like the evening grosbeak. Um, and of course, that's a bird that's had very large declines. And it's interesting if you look at its boreal range, um, which is in orange, overlaid with the red part, which is where um, all the forestry, oil and gas, uh, road building, mining, and all that stuff has taken place. Um, you see a major overlap between um, its occurrence in the southern boreal and and those activities, similar to, with Canada warbler and other um, rapidly declining species and a number of other species. All of this um, work that's been um, taking place to think about how we could do things differently to maintain all the ecological and biodiversity values that we all want to see maintained has been um, kind of taken some new turns over the last two decades as people have been uh, able to do more computer modeling as to what the different scenarios would look like if you lose certain amounts of, of habitat and, um, and also um, how much habitat you would need to have maintained in order to keep some of the services that you'd like. And what, you know, it's not really probably a great surprise. It's sort of common sense that you need to have more of it intact to maintain more of the values that we care about. Um, but as we're sort of seeing this kind of biodiversity and climate change crisis um, kind of loom up at us, it's becoming more apparent that we got to do things differently, especially in the places where we have the last chance to do it. And you know, the science is showing us that we need to maintain and protect, um, restore a much higher proportion of the landscape if we want to keep those values, if we want to keep species from going extinct, if we want to keep uh, clean air, clean water on, um, you know, available to keep us all, all alive. Fortunately, there's some really great news in the boreal forest of Canada. Um, indigenous people there um, who've been living there for thousands of years, um, who, who have never left, um, are leading the way in thinking about how to do conservation at a new scale, um, a scale that the world has, has rarely ever seen. I mean, already over the last 20 years or so, the scale of protection is mind-boggling, you know, getting close to 200 uh, million acres that have been protected over the last 20 years. Um, 20 years. Um, and right now, there are uh, proposals that will just boost this, you know, even much, much higher um, if they are allowed to move through. Um, so, you know, this is conservation at a scale that we haven't imagined for a long time, you know, maybe Teddy Roosevelt years in the early parts of the 1900s here in the U.S. when we were seeing very large scale um, conservation but um, we haven't seen anything like this, certainly in the U.S., you know, for, for a century and, um, and, um, and rarely in other parts of the world as well, except in a few, a very few places. And it's all across the boreal forest from, uh, from the Yukon, stretching all the way over to, to Newfoundland and Labrador, just amazing areas and amazing uh, conservation that's happening. Intertwined with that has been a movement to um, change the way the land is stewarded and, and managed um, through what are called indigenous guardians. Um, instead of having, you know, sort of people from down south uh, who are not from these areas kind of come up and be rangers and, and do all, the, all those kinds of duties, um, the people that have always been there are now taking those those things on in a really inspiring way through these indigenous guardians programs. Um, and it's also kind of a way that um, allows um, people who've always been there to have um, economic opportunity. In Australia, they, the federal government has a program like this. They call it indigenous rangers, um, but they 
um, provide support for about 700 uh, full-time jobs for people across their protected areas within um, Australia. And we're really hoping and urging the um, Canadian government to move that way. They've already started um, um, on that path, and, and, and it's really encouraging to see. I've been working in boreal conservation for 20 years or, or so, um, but I just brought over my um, expertise and, and program work to Audubon about three years ago. Um, and so Audubon is now fully engaged in, in this work in a new way that's really exciting. Um, and um, this is just kind of an outline of, of how how we're working, how we're organized on the in the boreal conservation program, working on um, communication that helps raise awareness of the indigenous work that's going on in, in conservation, the um, movement of for very large new indigenous protected areas um, and indigenous guardians programs. Um, we do science that helps support those efforts to move those forward specific collaboration with indigenous governments and communities. And we're just starting to dabble into um, how we might be able to support more boreal ecotourism so that these parks um, are still providing economic opportunity. Um, sometimes the industrial interests will tell some of the indigenous peoples that if they make a park that they're making a, what they call a wilderness ghetto, um, you know, a, a wonderful protected place, but no, no economic opportunity. And so things like indigenous guardians and ecotourism opportunities are, are ways to try to, to counter some of those, that narrative. Um, this is our, our team here that we've assembled um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna add, add some more, but you, some of you may know uh, some of these folks, Carrie uh, is actually a, a Mainer, lives down in Cape Elizabeth. So, um, She's um, been in, in the area and um, just finished her PhD last year at University of Maine Adorno. So maybe some of you know her. So as I said, you know, our, our main goal is to help move forward the momentum for trying to get um, these new indigenous protected areas that have been proposed over the over the finish line to get them protected. It's 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 hard, just like it is everywhere, to get places protected. There's a lot of um, interests that um, oppose these things, um, and you have to build strong public support in all the ways that we know about how to do conservation here in the U.S. It's the same thing. You got to get public support, and you have to do a lot of work to communicate and educate people about why places are special, and and get them on on your side. Um, and get the government on your side and so forth. And um, so, you know, some of that involves communication work like um, various pieces that highlight areas that we're trying to um, support. Um, it's work with media, um, helping uh, provide quotes to media related to why the boreal forest is so special and why we need to protect it, why the government should be supporting it, to actually publishing scientific papers um, they kind of go into the some more of the details about um, the, the state of conservation and, and what are some of the uh, values that should be protected. All of this work um, has been very successful in, in recent years. We were um, really elated last August when the federal government of Canada announced $340 million of new funding for Indigenous-led conservation um, for both the support of new indigenous protected areas and also for indigenous guardians programs. Um, and you can see some quotes here from some indigenous leaders um, that, that we work with, um, um, that we collaborate with on, on various projects here. Um, you know, this, this was a, a massive new federal investment in, in this work. I wanna just tell you quickly about a couple of specific projects that. Um, we're work, working um, on that we're collaborating with indigenous governments on. Um, one of them is a place called the Seal River Watershed in northern Manitoba, where you see that orange dot there, just to give you some context. This is a map, um, actually, that Carrie actually just produced for me today 
um, put it in context. Um, down on the right is where it's located um, in in the continent, and then kind of a, a zoom in. Um, it you might not be able to get the the sense of this just from these maps like this, but this is an area of 12 million acres. In other words, it's approximately half the size of the state of Maine, and four indigenous communities are proposing to protect this entire watershed. You know, I mean, this is, you know, just even to imagine protecting an area half the size of the entire state of Maine, um, you know, it's mind boggling how big, and of course, an area of 12 million acres supports tens of millions of birds, um, really important. This is some of the biggest conservation happening in the world today. One of the ways we're supporting this among, among a number is um, in a project that involves trying to help them survey the birds of the Seal River watershed. And so we've um, contracted with Cornell Lab of Ornithology to use their um, automated recording units, the SWIFT units, that's what you see over here on the right, little microphone sticking down. It's a unit that you can put out and leave out and it has a little computer in it that'll um, t um, have it turn on and off at certain times. So we have ours record for a few hours in the morning um, before and after dawn and a few hours before and after after dusk. And so they put together a little package of all the materials. That's what you see on the left. Uh, we shipped them up to the Seal River Watershed Alliance, um, and they got them up to a place called Tadouli Lake, where the Sayese Dene First Nation is located. And they got them out this May. It was This was actually even in late May. The ice was still on. Um, they went out on the ice and, and placed them out. And we got 10 of these recorders out. Um, these are the spots just to give you a sense across the Tadouli Lake. Um, and sent the sounds off to the, the SD cards. The, all the sounds are recorded on the SD cards. Pulled all the SD cards at the end of the season, sent them to Cornell, and they're using machine learning um, algorithms to try to process the sounds. And um, and this is some of the very first results we just got back a couple of weeks ago from from this. And the, the dots are the places where the recorders are, and the size of the dots is kind of the number of, of, of species um, found at each one. And just, you know, another quick little sense of um, the kind of results we got. This is from the 10 um, recording units, the first quick cut of the species um, that were found most um, commonly. And I just put the little green arrows on the more um, species that were most um, widespread in the area. And this is all done using machine learning, um, automated detection software and algorithms. And just some, some of the results for species, just, just to give you a sense of what you get. You know, the, the map on the right is the blue dots are all the locations and the red are the two of the 10 where fox sparrows occurred um, and the, the size of the dots related to sort of the total number of calls detected. Um, oh, I, I had a little sound in there, but I don't know if it's playing, but um, black pole warbler, another one um, on the, on the right, a map of the 10 locations. And you can see one location had a lot of songs of, black bow warbler and, and one other one, a small number. So, you know, you start putting these together and you can start building information out about what's there, where they're found and so forth. Another place that we are working is um, a place called the Pamachuanaki World Heritage Site, which is on the eastern side of Lake Manitoba um, and in Manitoba and, and, um, and um, in parts of Ontario. Uh, Lake Winnipeg, I mean, sorry about that. Um, this is a map that shows kind of its location in the world. Um, um, you can kind of zoom in um, and see um, in, in that area of Manitoba, um, this, this area, a uh, huge uh, area of, of millions of acres. Um, and I'm just going to, get again, just to give you a sense of it, um, zoom in on it through a series of images I just took out of, of, of Google Maps. You can see Maine here down in the right-hand corner, um, and up there the other green triangle is on, on Lake Winnipeg where um, the Pamachuanaki World Heritage Site is. 
And I'm going to zoom in on one of the First Nations. There's four First Nations that together um, put up this World Heritage Site um, to move it through the process to become designated. Um, but each of the four First Nations are independent First Nations. And we have um, been doing some work with the Poplar River First Nation for, for many years. I'm going to zoom in to the Poplar River First Nation here. You can see the eastern side of Lake Winnipeg and zooming in some more um, here. Um, and you see the area that says Neganan in the middle of the area. That's that's, that's uh, Poplar River. Um, and I'm just continuing to zoom in. Um, this is a, a little community. Um, it has no access to um, the roads um, in the um, except in winter. There's an ice road there, so coming and going from there through much of the year is, is only by air or by boat, um, and so they they have to be pretty self-sufficient um, within within the community for for much of the year because it's really hard to get out um, to get supplies in and things like that. And they've protected an area themselves about um, 2 million acres, about 10 times the size of Baxter State Park, about two and a half times the size of Cumberland County. This one First Nation, um, I, I believe it's the numbers in the community who li are living in the community is kind of under a thousand or something like that. Um, and they themselves have protected an, an area that large. Um, and it's just a beautiful place. I've had a chance to visit um, once um, and um, and just you know lakes of all sizes and types and rivers and just um, so beautiful. Um, I got to be able to um, be part of some ceremonies there, really moving connections to the land um, and just full of birds, you know, and and all sorts of of other other beautiful things. We started a project with their indigenous guardians program back in 2016 to do sound recording and started putting um, sound recording units up back then. And actually, we're just getting ready to release a report about some of that work, hopefully in, in the next month or two. Um, now, this is a little recording of it. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if you could hear some of that, but that's an actual recording from Poplar River. Um, as part of our work there, we're also trying to support the guardians themselves in some work. Um, we were able to, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this in a second, but um, they were interested in participating in some community science projects like um, Great Backyard Bird Count and Climate Watch, and um, we're, we're trying to participate. And we discovered um, partway through our encouragement of that that none of the guardians actually had binoculars. So we were kind of asking them to count birds and things like that without even having the, the optics that we all take for granted down here. So um, working to get things like binoculars for the guardians. Um, we were able to provide um, field guides and um, some simple cameras and different things like that for uh, one of the schools there and, and another one of the um, Machuniki communities, First Nations, the Blood Vein River First Nations. So just um, just some other kinds of ways that we're trying to help um, help with these these um, these efforts. I mentioned the binoculars and um, this is an interesting way in which Audubon chapters and at least one bird club have um, decided to participate and they've really wanted to be able to do something um, kind of concrete to be part of supporting these efforts. And so um, Red Rock Audubon has kind of been serving as a coordinator of a program to have different chapters um, put up some funds to buy new binoculars um, and um, get them to guardians at different First Nations around um, around throughout the boreal forest um, of Canada. We've focused so far in Canada with this, but you can kind of see these are um, some of the different Audubon chapters and, and one bird club, the Cayuga Bird Club, um, and where their binoculars that they've um, they've funded have have been have gone to the different Guardians programs. 
I bring that up with the hope that you guys may think about doing that. I'd love to have um, Mary Meeting Audubon be uh, on that map some point over the next year with some lines to either these or some other uh, First Nations supporting that, this kind of work. And I'll show you this this uh, um, graph again of the protection. You know, we try to really stay focused on the on the main objective of this is to get more acres protected and conserved for birds. Um, you know, that's the long-term goal. And um, and what's amazing is Canada, as a federal government, has committed to the new Convention on Biological Diversity um, benchmark of protecting. 30% of their lands and waters by 2030. And to do that means that there'll have to be an additional, um, you know, 100 plus million acres of new protected areas coming um, over the next 10 years. Um, that's only going to be possible with a huge amount of support to both indigenous governments and the, and the federal government has put a large amount of money. I told you about the 340 million they've committed to, to trying to help move that process forward, but also that um, nonprofits like Audubon and others um, co collaborate and come along as allies to help fill a lot of the um, different roles that it's going to be hard for, um, for some of the First Nations to um, get up to speed on super quickly. So that's why we have, you know, people who can work in science and communications to help um, get the message out, provide opportunities for the indigenous leaders to speak to media, to speak um, in various ways to, to groups, to let them know about what's going on and just provide support. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you think about conservation up there, if you're thinking about it from like the philanthropic investment side of it, you know, the, the return on investment down here, you know, it costs a lot of money to protect land, unfortunately, because that's the way you know our our system is currently. But up there, because most of this land is still in so-called crown land, you know, it's it's land controlled by the provinces and territories at some level, um, also um, you know by the indigenous people. Um, the opportunity to get it protected is much more cost-effective. You know, you can protect land for far less than a dollar an acre, you know, it's, it's, it's just um, cents compared to per acre compared to up here. So very good philanthropic um, investment um, in, in moving this forward. So I've mentioned a couple of ways people can, can help. One of those is that binocular donation effort through the chapter. Um, another is philanthropic investment. We're putting together a team of philanthropic um, investors to help you know, move this this work forward and we welcome everybody from you know um, from those who are giving at the six and seven figure level and we have some of those to those who are giving in the single digit level and I'd love to have any of you be part of that team um, but we also know that there's other ways you can help that are um, quite easy those things like um, getting signed up for our updates and I hope all of you will take a, a, a snapshot of the screen or or hit your print screen to save it um, so you can um, use it to um, follow, check up on these web websites. If you're on um, Twitter, you can start following uh, me and some of these other other um, uh, Twitter handles and start retweeting things and just amplifying the message so more and more people know about all this amazing work and, and we build the public support so we can get um, especially provincial and territorial governments to um, to come alongside and agree to these protections. We have a lot of provinces that don't readily agree to protecting these areas, some of, and some of them are hostile to them even. Some of the areas have been suggested for protections and, and proposed for protections by indigenous governments. And almost immediately, you know, um, in some provinces, they'll do things like um, give a mining permit right in the middle of the proposed protected area just to kind of thumb their nose at this effort. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's not an easy process um, and we need as much help as we can get. I will um, stop there and stop sharing my screen. Put my video back on. You can see me talking into my phone. <laughs> and
And I'm Fantastic. not sure how we're if we're set up to do um, questions or. Yeah, folks, if you have work. questions and want to put them down in the Q Q and A box, um, that would be great. We can read them here. John, I have you muted right now, just so you know you can undo that. Um, uh, so fire away. I, I will actually start if that's okay. Jeff, um, could you talk a little bit about the boreal forest in Maine and how maybe it looks different from some of the, uh, you know, forest further north that you're talking about conserving or sort of uh, what what's the boreal in Maine like? Yeah. The major difference in, so Maine has lots of boreal habitat, you know, the same species of trees and many of the same species of animals as, you know, birds and, and other and mammals, some of them. I mean, we used to have caribou, woodland caribou, of course, even. Um, so we have much of the same habitat. It's just in kind of smaller patches, in, you, might, you might say, um, you know, it tends to be in upper level elevations or in lowland um, areas in you know, around bogs or around um, streams and things like that. So um, we have the same habitat. And of course, there's even patches of boreal habitat that extend down the Appalachians. You know, there's some birds that we think of as as more, um, you know, boreal um, type birds that are found pretty far south down the Appalachians. Same thing in the Rockies, you know, that uh, some of these birds um, go up and down these higher elevations. So, um, so we have boreal habitat that goes well south of the boreal biome. Um, the the area that we are talking about is is the boreal biome, and it's basically characterized by having more uniform or larger patches of this habitat. But it's but it's still you know a matter of degree. Um, the the cutoffs are based on um, you know basically arbitrary decisions on what to delineate as one versus another. The most recent kind of work around, scientific work around mapping the boreal biome has, considers the areas um, like Maine and, and the northern fringe of states that have boreal habitat in them, um, as they call it hemiboreal. Um, so it's sort of, you know, a mix of boreal. And of course, you know, we have a lot of deciduous forests, as we know, you know, beech and, and maple forests. Um, so that's that's the kind of in, intermix o, oak as you go further south. So um, yeah, we we have the same um, same habitat, um, and um, it's just in kind of smaller patches in in certain parts of the state. Um, you know, one one thing I find really fascinating here in Maine is how we have boreal habitat on our islands and on the tips especially of many of our peninsulas and um, you know if you look at some of the work the paleological work of some of this you know they found that um, some some of these um, uh, places have been really important for certain species of trees for a very long time you know they've persisted there um, for for thousands of years you know in, in some of these spots um, so when you, when you think about climate change impacts and things like that, it's very interesting how how some of these um, kind of boreal patches that we have have been quite resistant to change because of things like you know the the uh, ocean temperatures that keep it cooler and things like that. But what you know, it's a, it'll be interesting to see, of course, what's going to happen in the future. But um, but yeah, I I've been very interested to see how our boreal habitat in Maine is in these kind of patches in certain places, kind of more island-like. Um, Thank you. Um, John, go ahead. Jeff, uh, one request first. Uh, would would you send that uh, screen that had the contact information to keep track of for all the different websites, et cetera, send that to me and I will make it available and anybody who's watching can ask me for the information. I'll share it with Maine Audu Mayor Meeting Audubon board. And we have one question has come in on the Q and A uh, at this point. It's what impact are you seeing on the boreal forest in Canada from global warming based on your collected data? Yeah, well, the, of course, um, 
as most people know, the further north you go, the you know the the, the impacts are are greater, you know, because the the the, the, change, the amount of change has been been even greater. The warming is greater up uh, as you go north. So so there's um, just massive changes that that have been documented if, from all sorts, and, and the indigenous people are among the ones that, you know documenting it. Um, you know, most regularly, partly because like elders and through indigenous knowledge, they have a better sense of what the baseline was. You know, Western science got started really late in, in collecting the baseline data, really, if you think of it, versus thousands of years of time that they've been there. Um, and in some cases, because it's so remote, we never got around to getting data. That's definitely true of the birds. You know, uh, we haven't had good bird data and still don't for large areas. That's why we're doing projects like the the automated recording unit work because there's, there's just so little information. Um, the, you know, we definitely um, have been seeing uh, changes like uh, birds showing up further north than they used to, lots of that kind of um, thing. You know, we, we see that here too, you know, these birds that are more regularly coming north. Um, staying later, um, all of those sorts of things, showing up earlier, all, all of those sorts of things, but also, you know, a lot more extreme things, just massive fires. I mentioned, you know, Pomacho and Aki, many of the communities in Pomacho and Aki, um, the last few summers, they've almost always had to evacuate for at least weeks at a time, like the entire community has to leave, they just leave a skeleton crew there to, you know, in case the fire gets too close to do something about it. But you know, have they all having to, to just leave and stay in hotels. It's just, it's, it's a really tough situation. And that's happening all across the boreal, um, horrible flooding, um, in, in lots of places in the North, you know, that they'd never have seen in hundreds or thousands of years, you know, the, 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 the flooding problems and, um, you know, the ice roads that are melting. So you can't get, even get your supplies in or out. You know, I was up in, the Moose Creek community on James Bay a few years ago in March. And, um, you know, we were trying to get from where you land on one side of the river to the community, which is on the other side of a very big river. And, you know, they had closed one of the ice roads and we had to take the other one and, you know, drive the truck through like three feet of water, which I found quite, quite scary over the ice myself. Um, um, they, you know, they did that kind of thing regularly, but, um, you know, but, but it just, you know, so they're kind of like living with all these risks all the time. Uh, we can't even imagine, um, you know, one of the guys was getting ready to, he was going to start on the ice road. All, that's like a, you know, six or eight hour drive south to get to a, a road before they, they had, a, they had officially closed it, but he had to get his truck out beforehand or it would be stuck up there for the whole year. Um, and so he was just going to risk going over all these, you know, the ice roads are going over ponds and lakes and rivers and they closed it because it's dangerous, but he was just going to go and risk it anyway, because he was trying to get his, you know, his truck out of there. So things we can't even imagine, you know, that people are living with, um, we are one of the whole goals of our, our work with the automated recording units and trying to, uh, get guardians more involved in bird monitoring is is to actually start looking at the changes um, and we even have started a new um, calling it uh, kind of um, it's a it's a climate watch story map that allows people to kind of document any kind of climate change impact they see with a photograph and then upload it um, on a, with a with a point to a point on the map so people could look at all these photos and see the changes with a little caption below it. And so we're sort of just working with some different communities and guardians programs and youth to start adding more and more of those. And there's some already some really amazing um, stories that have been added about, you know, everything from, you know, like I could say, you know, pelicans that are showing up in Northern Manitoba and Hudson Bay. Um, you know, I think there was a great blue heron up in, way up north in the Northwest Territories, you know, um, you know, hundreds of miles north of where they're supposed to be, polar bears that showed up in far south in a town in, in, uh, on Great Bear Lake of like 500 miles from the Arctic uh, coast where they should be. Um, just all kinds of stories that are of 
they will give you a sense of the reality of the change going on up there. And we're hoping we're going to start get that packaged up so we can start sharing it more broadly. It's been kind of more of an internal thing that we're having the letting the indigenous people add their information. And we haven't quite grown it to where we're going to put it out there for the world to see, um, to share, but we, but we need to, because there's so many changes going on. Thank you. Uh, a second question that came in was, what constitutes a protected area? Does it mean no human interference at all or sustainable forestry or allowed? What, what can take place? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good, good question. Um, for the most part in what um, we're calling protected areas, they're more like a national park, um, that type of designation in the U.S., um, and so they typically would not in allow any kind of commercial scale extractive ac activities of any type. Um, they would in allow, of course, you know, ecotourism activities just like our parks do. Um, some, um, some of them might have, uh, especially in remote communities where they have no, you know, they need to be able to get wood for, you know, building a house or whatever, you know, they, their own small scale projects sometimes they will have you know allow that kind of thing and of course they need wood often just to heat up you know heat a home or a cabin um but it's just not it's but it's you know it's just kind of very local small scale types of things um but that isn't to say that there might be places where it could involve some other kind of you know sustainable forestry and things like that further south there are examples where um some of these um have had uh, you know, sustainable forestry kind of activities and, and different kinds of things like that. So um, the whole idea of, you know, what we've been calling indigenous protected areas, or ind sometimes they're called indigenous protected and conserved areas, is still an evolving thing. I mean, a lot of times the indigenous nation may declare it as protected, but as I said, the provincial government just ignores it. It doesn't mean anything, you know, um, from their perspective. And so if you, so you really need to have multiple layers of protection, you know, it can be an indigenous protected area within the indigenous government, but we need to have the provincial government agree to take it off limits as well. And sometimes we need the federal government to, you know, add resources to make it a national park or whatever. So it's a very, it tends to be a super complicated process a lot of different negotiations going on. There's sometimes, you know, forestry or mineral companies or oil and gas companies that say, no, no, we don't want that part of that in the air. That's a potential place for X, Y, and Z, you know, so then, then you've got to negotiate back and forth. And so it's, it's super complicated and, um, and it's, and it's has so many layers related to social issues and um, kind of the growing, um, recognition of indigenous um, rights in Canada, it's um, advanced pretty far in, in some ways because of some recent Supreme Court decisions in the last um, three to five years that have um, affirmed the, the right of First Nations to um, at least have co-management responsibility of their traditional territories. Um, it, you know, there's still more testing of that in, Supreme, in the Supreme Court about like how far that goes exactly. And each province views it a little bit differently. And, you know, politics, of course, as it does everywhere, plays into it. So, so it's a complicated process, but, the, we, you know, they just need as many allies as possible to be supporting it to make it, you know, make, make it, make it happen. And um, there's luckily, there's a lot of great, um, environmental and conservation organizations that are involved in different ways to support this. Uh, there needs to be, because if you're talking about conservation at the scale, you just need, you need a lot of allies and partners um, to make it happen. So is it uh, members of the First Nation that are at the table with the provincial governments or, or the federal government or with Audubon and, yeah. and others supporting the the First Nation representatives, or who who sits there? Well, typically, yeah, typically it would be you know the First Nation itself, you know, and and its own um, negotiators, and their whether you know whether it's the chief or 
you know, chief and council, or sometimes, you know, they have somebody specifically in the community that they've, um, that they appoint to that job as a negotiator, lead negotiator or negotiating team. Some communities that have more resources will also bring in, um, you know, le- lawyers to help. Mm-hmm. Typically, there are specialized law firms that, you know, work in indigenous um around in you know in indigenous support um so they're kind of experts in all the intricacies of of the process and what you know there, there's so many it's so it's some of it's almost you know byzantine kind of all the all the little uh, nuances mm-hmm. when you start doing the negotiations with government there's a lot of intricacies on the legal side and on the political side and on the social side um so it's, it's it's complicated but you know a lot of the um first nations don't have a lot of capacity and they sometimes will ask um you know um and uh ngos you know or environmental organizations to to be to to work with them you know to come with them if it's if if that's beneficial you know the way we operate in most I would say, you know, most of the the uh, the best um, NGOs are operating in that arena. Is you know, we do everything. Um, we follow the lead of the First Nation, and we 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 tell them we're we're there to support if they ask us to, and if they tell us to not to be involved or to to leave, we leave. You know, I mean, it's it's their their decision, and um, we don't ever use their name or in any of our communications or talk about what they do without them having given permission and reviewed anything we write always runs runs through them we never represent their them you know um we we try to make a space for them to represent themselves and so you know we're really trying to be clear that we're we're trying to be an ally but we're not trying to supplant the leadership or anything like that, you know, and some of our work in supporting guardians or youth guardians in schools is to help build more of that capacity. So there are more people eventually who can just be stepping into those roles. Um, You know, we're looking into some different ways we can support some young indigenous students at the college level as well, you know, and just finding ways that we can help among a lot of NGOs, you know, to support building up that capacity um you know even with our with our um sound recording unit work you know we're when we um if we're paying cornell a certain amount of money to do the work that they're doing we we kind of have a rule that we are paying the guardians and the people who are putting the recorders out on the land at least an equal amount in other words we're not valuing like the academics more which is the old-fashioned way is you know you'd you'd pay a bunch of academics a bunch of money and have them, they would fly up there, they'd do the work and then they'd leave and they, nobody, you know, nobody from the community even knew what they were doing. It, they might hire them to drive them out in a snowmobile and that would be it, you know, or to make them a meal, you know, but it, there's nothing meaningful there. So we're trying to change the whole paradigm of that, you know, these, these we're collaborating at their permission, you know, and if they, and, and they have a t- opportunity to be involved as, at the level that they want. But, you know, even the data we collect, you know, we're saying, I said to them, you know, the sounds we're collecting, you guys own those. You guys own the rights to them. We are not going to do anything with that unless we have your permission. Um, you know, the data analysis, we're not going to release the results of that. Cornell's doing all this fancy stuff, you know, um, with their automated algorithms and so forth. But until the community sees that results and is happy with it and gives us permission, we we won't be doing anything with it. You know, it's they're leading it, and that's that's the way this works. You know, and it's it's a bit of a new for some people. That's a new way of thinking about how to do this work. But it's but it's it's vital. You know, I mean, and it's the way that we're going to save the most birds. You know. <laughs> sort of a selfish way to look at it in a sense too, but it's, you know, that's the way of the world to get it done, you know? Good. 
uh, the question I think you'll uh, appreciate perhaps to have from one of the board members of Mirror Meeting Audubon is, can you send information to the Mirror Meeting chapter about the binocular program and its details? Of so, course, yeah. Uh, Yes, of course. Yeah, we, you know, we basically, I mean, to give you a quick nutshell of it, it's, you know, we've um, been getting, um, oh, now I forgot the name of the company, but um, kind of a, you know, giving us a, a very good price on new binoculars. And um, like I say, it's, there's a, a, a person at Red Rock Audubon who's actually a former, uh, he, he's, he was a former regional representative to the National Audubon Board, and he heard me speak about this at the national board meeting a couple of years ago and just was really excited about somehow he wanted to be involved. And so he's kind of helping to lead that. So he kind of has worked out this thing with, with um, you know, a binocular company to get a, a, a discount. So we, you know, basically just buy buy them a discount and and I do the figuring out which indigenous guardian program can use them and figuring out how to, you know, who to get them to and that sort of thing. And, um, and then we, we get them up there and, you know, one of the things about it is where uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a much appreciated investment and, and support. Um, but it's, but it, but it's, um, but it's one of you know many activities that they're involved in, many kinds of support they're getting. So sometimes I do try to make sure uh, shoppers understand, like we're, you're not going to get like a a monthly you know report back on what's happening. You know, it's, it's like you know they're they're you, well you know we're, if we're lucky we're going to get a few photographs here and there through through the year of people using them, and you know maybe uh, ideally there's some some connection that could grow over time where you know. There could be some more that will happen. That's that's my hope. You know that we'd make further connections. Um, uh, maybe maybe uh, you know at some point some people will get to visit some of these places and and get to meet people and different things like that. Um, that's a longer term hope. You know, but um, so um, but I mean it's it's so appreciated. Like we we were literally quite shocked when we were we had been supporting and working with the training for these guardians to do climate watch. And they actually went through one of the seasons to do it. And we were starting to ask some questions about it and this and that, you know, and doing it over Zoom, of course, because it all happened in the middle of, of, of this. Um, and at some point, you know, they were talking about trying to see some of these birds that they were supposed to identify and how hard it was and whatever. And I started asking about the optics and they were all, well, no, well, no we, none of us have any binoculars. <laughs> we're just doing this by, you know, we're, by eye, you know, trying to tell a white throated sparrow from a white crown sparrow at, you know, a hundred yards without binoculars is not going to be too easy. So, um, I mean, we just didn't, it didn't occur to us because, you know, down here, you set up a program like that and you get people to do it and everybody, you know, we're birders, everybody. So it's some of the just things, the barriers you wouldn't even think of that make such a huge difference. You know, it's, it's not a huge, a lot of money to get some binoculars. Um, but it makes such a huge difference. It's just, it's just not, you know, where are you even going to start with some of these things? So, um, so it's, it's kind of a cool way to, to help start building something. And, you know, if you're thinking of it as, as that kind of investment of, you know, you're helping to start building something um, that's going to be growing over the years, it's kind of cool to be in on, in on the, the first, you know, innovative steps in that direction. Very good. And, and if uh, anybody out there wants to, you know, do a, you know, a six figure, seven figure part of the philanthropic <laughs> effort, of course, um, yeah. don't hesitate to call. I, I'm always happy to take that call. Okay. And I, I did have a request from another bird club that was represented in the audience that they want the information, a copy of the information when you send it to us too. So. Okay. We'll spread, well, we're spreading I appreciate the you stepping up to yeah well I appreciate you you stepping up to be a coordinator to get all this information out I didn't you probably didn't know you were going to become a <laughs> well, it's not an unpleasant a coordinator task. to help good yeah. good thank yeah. you and thank you all for um yes and thank you very much Jeff for the
for the talk and thank you to Maine Audubon for their support and uh, the Zoom capabilities. And uh, we'll definitely be in touch. So thanks again. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.